Next up, we have Drapa. As far as dragon types go, Drapas is pretty singular. It's based on a specific type of Chinese dragon, the Zulong, or Torch Dragon, which is characterized by possessing the face of an old man and the body of a dragon. Now you know why Drapa looks elderly. That's very much on purpose. In fact, its name is even a combination of dragon and grandpa, which makes sense considering how much Drapa cares for children. Today, we're going to see if Drapa was able to transcend its genteel nature to find success in the notoriously ruthless competitive scene. And so, we ask, how good was Drampa actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Players weren't sure what to make of Drampa at first. It had several excellent attributes, several decent to average ones, and several poor ones. It had two great stabs coming off of a special attack set higher than Latios's, as well as a deep move pull to accentuate them, and three varyingly useful abilities to boot. However, its abysmal speed, only decent bulk, and unspectacular defensive typing prevented it from getting the most out of its positives. In short, its defensive profile wasn't sufficient to withstand the high power level of tiers across Generation 7, until it reached PU. There, the power level was just right for Drapa's toolkit, and it didn't just find a niche, it thrived. It was excellent at switching into offensive and defensive Pokemon alike, perfectly exemplified in its Sap Sipper ability, which allowed it to switch in with impunity on the many Grass-type moves that were among the most difficult to answer in the tier. Victory Bell's Strength Sap, Ferris Seed's Leech Seed, and Tangela's Sleep Powder. Packing an outright immunity to the many Grass moves that dealt direct damage was also excellent, allowing it to completely blank something as powerful as Victory Bell's Leaf Storm that tended to chunk even many recess for solid damage. Additionally, if Drampa didn't switch in directly, it still had an easy time hitting the field thanks to the plethora of switch moves in the tier, like Rotom Frost's Vault Switch and Primeape's U-Turn. Once Drapa was in, it was perfectly equipped to instantly bring the pain like almost nothing else in the metagame. Its Draco Meteors were hard hitters by OU standard, so pretty much everything in PU that wasn't Fairy type or a bulky Steel type evaporated instantly. Plus, the most common Fairy types, Savali Fairy and Clefairy, weren't exactly keen on switching into Drapa on account of getting obliterated by its secondary stab, Hyper Voice. Hyper voice was quite spammable in its own right. Most popular recess in Regirock and the tier's many ghost types were utterly terrified of Draco Meteor turning them into a fine mist. Yes, steel types resisted both Drapa's stabs, but they were destroyed by its fire type coverage. The same fire type coverage it used to threaten the grass types it switched in on. It was so threatening with just these three moves, it almost didn't have to run a fourth slot. But of course, it did. And thanks to its deep move pull, it was even more threatening. As with Focus Blast, it shredded common Pokemon like Type Null, as well as lesser seen options like Credit and Munchlax. However, it could also run Energy Ball to great effect, as it allowed it to threaten Jellicent out one-on-one, -on -one, which it otherwise would struggle to do so, and completely invalidated Carbink's otherwise solid typing as a check to its main three moves. Drapa would have had a fantastic place in the PU metagame just off of the strength of its spec set, combining defensive utility with peerless wall breaking power. But by diversifying its set choice and increasing its defensive utility while still remaining threatening, it made itself truly elite. It ran an incredibly solid calm mindset, and while calm mind was great on it, the real draw, at least for most of the battle, was the fact that the recovery of Leftovers and Roost allowed Drampa to consistently take advantage of its defensive capabilities and thereby reliably reinforce the integrity of its team's defensive core. Of course, once the opposing team has started weakening and the shape of the endgame started creeping in, Drampa insidiously became a potent late game threat with Calm Mind. Early game, it mostly just switched in and staved off threats on the opposing team and stayed healthy while everything else was worn down, biding its time until it could show off its skills as one of the tier's least flashy yet fierce versus cleanup artist. Of course, even without boost from specs or combine, Drapa hit incredibly hard between its high special attack and good power and coverage of its attacks, so it was far from passive. A valuable trait in a bulky Pokemon. Against offensive teams, Combine's special defensive boost made Drampa even tougher to break through, letting it tank even blizzards from Rotom Frost, Abomasnore, and Auroras, to say nothing of the tier's other special attacks like Oricorio Hurricanes, which just utterly bounced off. Meanwhile, bulky teams struggled to scratch Drapa as it repeatedly boosted its special attacks and proceeded to bowl them over. Drapo could also potentially finagle some more utility out of its set with an attribute that made it even more unique. Though it usually preferred Sap Sipper as its ability, it could also use Berserk, which provided a plus one special attack boost once Drapo's health was lowered to 50% or lower. Given Drapo's propensity for switching in and taking hits and how good it was at taking those hits, it could very easily have its health lowered to that range, activate Berserk, then roost off the damage and have a free plus one special attack boost, letting it hit even more insanely hard and having a 
screwed the boost just for doing what it always did, i.e. switching in and taking hits. Talk about turning defense into offense. No matter what it did, Drappa was going to put in the work. That was a big part of what was so wonderful about it. It was so inherently good that it had a lot of freedom to experiment while not losing any of the traits that made it successful in the first place. For example, though rare, both of its specs and leftover sets could be replaced with Draconium Z if it desired, and it remained excellent in its usual way while gaining a new method with which to dismantle the opponent. Drapper was so good, Defog was a complete afterthought in its move pool. Compare that to the Pokemon whose entire viability or close to it came from their access to that move, many of them sharing the PU tier with Drapa. So all in all, Drapa was one of the best, most consistent, and defining Pokemon in Generation 7 PU. Drampa had a relatively limited presence in VGC, but it did see a smattering of successful placements, including two tournament wins, with Gavin Michaels winning the San Jose Regional and Alex Underhill winning the Fort Wayne Regional Post Worlds. At the time of Michaels' win early in the season, weather teams with Torkoal and Gigalith were popular, as was Gastrodon for its ability to take on a vast assortment of weather-boosted assaults. Michaels was using a Trick Room team with Araquanid and Magnezone and needed an answer to these threats. Enter Drampa, whose Cloud9 ability nullified weather while one hit KOing Gastrodon with energy ball and being a threat in its own right with its low speed turned to its advantage under Trick Room, allowing it to launch its mighty Draco Meteor. Drapo was key to Michaels' success, taking out two Gastrodon in the top cut portion of the tournament. Though this early win seemed like it would prime Drapa for further usage and success, the evolution of the metagame was hostile to it, and Drapa more or less disappeared for several months. The two most popular team archetypes were Gact, or Garchop, Arcanine, Celesteela, Tapu Koko, and Fake, or Fini, Arcanine, Cartana, Electric, with the Electric being Coco or Togedemaru. The reason Drampa was so difficult to make work was because these archetypes had an incredibly easy time slapping on the core of Snorlax and Mimikyu, both of which stopped Drampa in his tracks. And even beyond this core, once the player base realized how incredible Snorlax was, that was enough in and of itself, and it was also a Trick Room abuser that handled Gastrodon. It was with Underhill's aforementioned win that Drampa returned to prominence. He utilized a Trick Room team and style differing from the previous approach, a hard Trick Room team, meaning it aimed to win the battle after setting up Trick Room just once. Mimikyu was used for this task, supported by Lucario's final gambit or Hariyama's fake out to ensure it wouldn't be disrupted by doing so. Once Trick Room had been set, Torko was primed to launch its eruption, one of the game's most powerful spread moves, and thus the rest of the team was geared towards facilitating it by hitting what it couldn't. For instance, Mudsdale and Hariyama smashed Gigalith, while Mimikyu and Drampa would destroy Garchomp. Underhill wasn't just using Drampa in a different setting though, he was also using a different Drampa set, Choice Specs, which was almost exclusively clicking one move. Choice Specs Hyper Voice, another incredibly strong spread move. Not only did the best friend duo of Torkoal and Drampa under Trick Room threaten to KO both opposing Pokemon with their monstrously strong spread move combination, Torkoal helped make Drampa even stronger. Drampa's fire resistance meant it withstood eruption well and would often get knocked down to half health, activating its Berserker ability and giving it a plus one special attack boost, hitting even harder and letting it plow through the likes of Snorlax and Tapu Fini. These these two were the most significant instances of Drampa's usage and success, but it had several other placements, like the ones on screen here. Congratulations to these players as well. So overall, Drampa's role was a limited but unique, legitimate, and a fantastic blend of team support, as well as an offensive threat. And special thanks to Gavin Michaels and Alex Underhill for the information. Generation 8's limited initial Pokedex did wonders for Drapa's viability, as it shot from PU all the way to UU in the tier's early stages. Its most valuable use was being able to reliably counter the famously uncounterable Chandelure through sufficient bulk, alongside a fire resistance and outright immunity to ghosts. The latter was particularly valuable in Gen 8, as Spec's Shadow Ball had become one of the most spammed attacks in the light of removal of pursuit. Plus, even though it countered Chandelure to the great envy of other defensive Pokemon, Drapa was far from just a defensive Pokemon itself. Itself. It was also difficult to answer in its own right, with its Draco Meteor being incredibly spammable. The tier's only fairy type was Galarian Weezing, which was completely obliterated by Hyper Voice and took heavy damage from Fire Blast as well. Now, Drampa didn't exactly take over Yu since its defensive use didn't extend far beyond Chandelure, but since Chandelure destroyed pretty much everything else, Drampa's niche, though limited, was legitimate, especially since it responded with such ferocious offense of its own. Drampa really took off once it hit Ryu. Its typing perfectly suited to a lower tier 
your environment, provided it plenty of switch-in opportunities, and its excellent move pool allowed it to fill a variety of different roles, often oscillating between defensive utility and offensive prowess on the same stat. Defensively, its most notable attribute was completely stifling one of the most out-and-out -out oppressive moves in the metagame, Vile Plume Strength Stat, which otherwise brutalized nearly the entire tier. Drampa could and did run specs to great effect, launching obscenely powerful Draco meters while destroying Aromatis and Sovali Fairy with Hyper Voice, and Copperaja and Steelix with Fire Blast. Even the insanely bulky Storlax was smashed by Focus Blast, which also cut through specially defensive Scrafty. Drampa was downright impossible to switch into. However, players also appreciated its bulk, especially since it naturally hit so hard, so they still got plenty of offensive value out of it, and thus opted for sets with Leftovers and Roost, though this was hardly limiting as such sets had plenty of variety to them as well. The Calm Mind set returned with a vengeance, but Drampa was also used to Defog for the first time, and could even function as an outstanding Paralysis Spreader with Glare. Even with focusing on the latter two utility options, Drapper retained offensive investment and thus remained a threat in its own right, because it was too dangerous to not use in that vein since truly countering Drampa didn't really exist. You pretty much just had to beat Drampa before it beat you, and one of the best ways to level the playing field was to use your own Drampa. Despite Drampa's absolute excellence in RU, it was NU by usage for quite some time, which was truly bizarre and spoke to the strangeness of usage-based tiering. Drampa was utterly ferocious in NU, primarily donning choice specs as its powerful attacks cut through the tier with even greater ease. You could try to absorb Hyper Voice with Kofagrigus or Draco Meter with Kofari, but you were walking on eggshells since Drampa just needed to get one turn right to utterly ruin you. And with the tier's lower power level, it got a lot of opportunities to look for that one turn. Drampa was considered by many to be overwhelming and was voted on, only to narrowly avoid the Banhammer. However, its continued presence was beginning to look suspect as it simply Draco Metered nearly everything so easily that it was planned to vote on it again. But then enough players recognized Drapa's greatness in RU that it rose to the tier naturally by usage, finally receiving official confirmations of its legitimacy in that metagame, though that was mostly a formality and it likely would have left NU anyway. The Isle of Armor came around and Drampa initially managed to stay in RU, but it went from elite to niche incredibly fast. Explode largely overtook its role in the tier as a specs wall breaker. And yeah, Drampa's defensive profile let it check Pokemon like Heliolisk and Inteleon, and its Draco meter was stronger than Explode's Boom Burst, but Boom Burst was repeatedly spammable, and Explode had an actually decent speed stat. Basically, Explode pretty much yelled louder than Drampa. Thus, Drampa, while definitely good to decent and still occasionally worthy of use, was too specific to be consistently used on teams, and thus it found itself dropping to NU again. And there, it ravaged the tier as if determined to prove the player base wrong for not banning it last time. The tier was full of weak defensive Pokemon that couldn't touch it, and those same defensive Pokemon, like Galarian Stunfist, were utterly mauled by one of Drampa's Draco Hyper Voice Fire Coverage Trio. And it was so strong that its stabs tended to be a bit much for even Resist to handle at times. It wasn't just a Punisher of Walls though, not at all. Its bulk and typing let it take on the likes of Ninetales and Rotom, turning what would be dangerous opposing offensive threats into an opportunity for it to launch its mighty attacks. Drampa's reign over Isle of Armor NU was as dominant as it was short. It was quickly recognized as overbearing for the tier and managed to snag the ban that had eluded it the first time around. When the Crowd Tundra came around, Drampa managed to withstand Power Creep and find itself a solid albeit limited role in RU once again as a defogger capable of checking popular Pokemon like Viaplume, Delmise, Rhyperior, Steelix, and Seismitoad while still hitting the opponent hard with offensive investment. It wasn't going to pull off any incredible wall breaking of late game sweeps, but it was a solid Pokemon, though more of a specific niche choice to plug holes on teams rather than anything you'd use consistently. Of course, it didn't have anywhere near the usage of RU proper, but this time around, it didn't have that in NU either, as Power Creep had finally become too much for it. Defensively, its Vile Plume checking ability was valuable as ever, but keeping Drampa in check had suddenly become, well, not easy, but much, much easier with the addition of Sylveon, a fairy type with huge special defense that does did not crumple in the face of Hyper Voice, as well as Stack Attacka, whose Draco resists and quadruple Hyper Voice resists, went along with a great special defense stat and neutrality to even Fire Blast. Neither of those were ironclad against Drampa, but they sure made it easier to play around. It wasn't just about walling or playing around Drampa defensively now either. It was also much, much easier to limit Drampa's opportunities since the tier had such an influx of dominant fighting types in Toxicroak, Passimian, Scrafty, and Gallade. Finally, Drampa had incredibly difficult competition with one of the best Pokemon in the tier, Alolan Exeggutor, whose secondary stab Leaf Storm ripped through the tier with greater ease and matched up better against bulky staples, Gastrodon, and Mudsdale to boot. Drampa didn't become completely unviable, of course, as his Calm Mind Roost set distinguished itself from Alolan Egg, and it could potentially turn the tables on Sylveon completely, but it had to be careful about setting 
this opportunity up as it was difficult to do so and therefore difficult to extract mileage from Drampa consistently. It became decent but specific and niche just like in RU. This newfound limited viability and usage in NU led Drampa to, at long last, return to its original home of PU. How did Drampa celebrate the homecoming? By shredding the entire metagame into ribbons of course. At first it seemed pretty easy to check Specs Drampa as one of the best Pokemon in the tier, Special Defensive Gigalith with the Special Defense boost from its own Sandstorm completely stuffed Hyper Voice, laughed at Fire Blast, and absorbed even Draco Meter quite decently. That lasted for about all of two seconds, aka until Drampa changed its ability from Sap Sipper to no, not Berserk, but Cloud 9, which completely invalidated the effects of weather. Gigalith promptly dropped to a single Draco Meter without even 6% Sand Chip on Drampa for its efforts. And the player base realized that this aggression would not stand, man. It took surprisingly long for Drampa to actually get banned, but it was really a matter of when, not if. As always, the tier's fairy types, Audino, Clefairy, Rabombi, and Whimsicott all got blasted by Hyper Voice, and nearly everything else got obliterated by Draco Meteor. Well, besides Ferrisseed, which was of course cooked by Flamethrower, as were Rabombi and Whimsicott, of course. Drampa's wide-reaching coverage was so good, you couldn't even predict around it with any degree of reliability, especially since it found its way into games so easily against staples like Weezing, Quagsire, and Jellicent, as well as the aforementioned Ferrisseed or Gigalith. Players were so desperate to not get bowled over by Specs Drampa that they began running Protect on multiple Pokemon to scout it, and then Drampa used Calm Mind on the Protect and proceeded to beat them even harder, even taking away the revenge killing potential of Whimsicott and Rabombi's Moonblast. Countering or even checking Drampa was pretty much impossible on paper and in practice as well. He pretty much accepted that you lose a Pokemon to it when it came in and just had to try and limit it coming in as much as possible. An unreasonably difficult task considering its excellent defensive profile. Using your own Drampa helped quite a bit, just like in early RU, except this time, the player base got so fed up with Drampa's overbearing reign over the tier and hit it with the Banhammer. And with its final status of PUBL, Drampa capped off an incredibly successful Generation 8. And that's it. So how good was Drappa actually? Well, it's only been around for two generations, but Drappa has already established itself as an elite lower tier Pokemon. It was one of the very best in PU and Gen 7, then in one of the most insane sophomore seasons in competitive Pokemon history, outdid itself over and over in Gen 8. The initial stint in UU was cool, but it really made its money from how it terrorized RU, NU, and PU. It arguably should have been banned from NU twice, but the first time around, it rose to RU by usage naturally before it got a chance. So it had to settle for one ban from NU and one ban from PU, utterly dominating both tiers. So overall, Drampa has the tools to be a consistently outstanding choice in the lower tiers and will almost certainly show itself to great effect once again in the future. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Drampa? What would you give it to make it OU? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.